we are on the cloud. Don't forget that this call, as with all of our calls, adheres to our code of conduct, um, which you can find and that we will link in the chat in a moment. Um, be respectful of each other. We love this community share out space um, and be kind to each other. That being said, I think we'll get started. All right, so uh, welcome to the second and the last community share out of, um, of Bookdash. Um, community share outs are a really special event within the Turing Way community. It's a place where we get to um, meet kind of from all different parts of the project, um, folks working on really different things in many different directions. And this is a place where that all of that kind of comes together. Um, we have a couple of special things that we'll be sharing this time around. Um, we're going to begin with kind of some general project updates. Um, and I'll be passing the mic around to a couple of folks um, who've been working on some really exciting things all across uh, the Turing Way. And then we'll share just a little bit more about just kind of taking a moment to celebrate what has happened over the course of the past six, eight months. Um, it's been a really, really active year. And then we'll pass it on to the good stuff. And while you're here, what you're here for, which is um, to tell us more about what you've been up to this week. So with that, I'm gonna do a quick share of my screen here to get us started. Hi Liz, welcome, welcome. Great to have you here. Just as we are getting started, we just started the recording here. Um, Emma is sharing in a pad in the chat uh, with a little check-in question. You may recognize some familiar names there. Um, and just a question about what you're keen to learn more about at our community share outs. Um, what I'm getting started with now is a short kind of slide presentation. There's a link to the PDF in the, um, in the Slack, um, as well as a link shared of, of the presentation more broadly. So with that, I'll guide us through kind of what we've been up to over the course of the past eight months. So first things first, um, a couple of updates um, about the governance. Over the course of the past, uh, over the course of the past uh, six eight months, um, we've noticed a lot of uh, different projects really happening all across the train way in many different directions. Um, and this working group effort, we'll talk more about in a second, is really an attempt to formalize a lot of that work and labor happening within the project, and also to recognize the work that has already been done um, by many other folks, many of which are are here today. So what I'm sharing now is a kind of graph uh, that we've developed of governance structures. It's kind of three sets of um, circular bubbles that are showing on one hand, you know, our project team, which is composed of Turing Way staff uh, that work on operation and strategy. And there's kind of a, a second bubble there of core volunteers who are recruited from the community that work on community and accountability. And then you have a third bubble next up that's really, you know, is composed of staff members with a paid allocation to work on the project. And they really have been working on organizational support of the project. And as we, we meaning our, the broader organizational team of the Turing Way and folks within the community kind of come together, we realized that many of the work that folks were doing were kind of split in these three directions. But to use those three categories alone, you know, erases all of the different types of work already happening um, within the Turing Way. And so we have kind of another graph here that we've developed, which includes, you know, folks that are doing everything from authoring, being authors, reviewers, and editors of the Turing Way, to translating, leading language translation, um, who are speaking, presenting, and training others on all sorts of new tools and different ways of working, as well as infrastructure maintainers who ensure the continuation of the Turing Way book. All of that and all those different types of roles is happening alongside you know, collaborations with other projects and organizations really all across the open science ecosystem from um, TU Delft to the eScience Center in the Netherlands to I2C, Binder, Jupiter, Open Life Science and other partners. Um, and all of these, you know, moments where all these different parts of the project interact is everything in everything from co-working calls to fireside chats to book dashes like this week, workshops and trainings and other collaborations. Um, and so as we, you know, thought about the question of how do we, you know, create governance structures or support governance structures, 
can that can support all of the different types of projects happening within the Turing way, we thought, you know, hey, this is the part where we get to experiment a little. So with that being said, over the course of the past um, eight to nine months, but it really has a much longer tail, um, we've seen the development of uh, a series of emergent teams related to um, translation and localization um, that just earlier this year, uh, we'd officially formalized in the Ways of Working document. Um, we'll be passing the mic in a second so they can tell you a little bit more about what they've been up to. Um, but most recently, we've also uh, been working to develop an infrastructure maintainers working group to formalize a lot of the, the maintenance work that's been ongoing within the project that's already being done. Um, and we just, as of this morning, um, UK time, just added some of uh, their work to the Ways of Working document as well. Within the Turing staff, we've also seen that we've kind of experimented and aimed to develop two sets of working groups. One is a reviewers and editors group. Again, they'll tell you more about what they've been working on in a second, as well as a trainers and mentors group as well. But alongside all of these themes, we've also seen um, the growth of new uh, subjects and topics that are really of importance and interest to the community related to accessibility and communication. And we really want to see how we can support those efforts um, in that direction as well. And the way that we've illustrated this is kind of, think of kind of a large circle of all of the, com the community of past, current, and potential contributors, and these four categories of translators and languages leads, speakers, presenters, and trainers, infrastructure maintainers, and authors, reviewers, and editors, kind of all in bubbles within that kind of wider uh, community bubble. But with that being said, I'm gonna stop here and stop sharing my screen and pass the mic to folks within the working groups to tell you, and within all the different teams across the project to tell you a little bit more about what they've been working on. So the first person I'll pass it on to would be, I believe, Andrea of the translation and localization team. Thank you, Anne. I will share my, I, I put the slides in the Slack um, and will share my screen too. I have to, I have to check. Um, so yes, to, today I am representing the translation and localization team, but here we have in the call Alejandro and we have, um, and we have Melissa too, but and we are more more people. Um, let me share here. Um, Can you see my slides? Okay, thank you so much. So yes, uh, we are a team of uh, translation and localization. And the motivation behind uh, why translate and localize is that um, we want to democratize and, and give access to non-native English speakers around the world. So most of the of the material in the internet about open research is in English, and and people who come from other countries always do the work of of having to translate. And these efforts are uh, sometimes they are individual. So lots of people doing translations isolated in in a way in a way that is isolated. It's better if we have teams to do that. Um, we see translation and localization efforts as a way to onboard people from all across all around the world to the community and it's it's been it's been uh, depicted as one of the pathways to collaboration of to the Turing way in addition to creating content and to and to outreach efforts um it's also a way of community building and to give continuity continuity so uh we have seen efforts of translation and localization that uh, you need a team for them to continue because not every this is mostly volunteer work and um, some efforts will not be will not have continuity if we don't have a way to support to, to build a supportive community and and to and to give tools and to and to build a structure that that lasts in time even if people come and go with a proper onboarding and offboarding so 
Yeah, so first it's a way of community building. And also part of the goal is that, uh, that uh, the conversation about open research does not happen only in English. So translation efforts, sometimes they feed back to proposing new content and or people um, use the guide as a way of the, the translation efforts as a way to, to to read and to study the guide and in this in this way of interacting with the with the Turing way. Um, some new content is proposed. So so the so it's also a way to to create new content or to or to have it corrected, for example, edited. We have a team. And um, it's, a, it's a team that uh, is composed by Batul and Alejandro, who is here, and Camila, uh, Melissa Black, Asma Kassem, Pamela Villar Gonzalez, Anil Tungel, and Chip Demosen, who are part of the team. But we are actually actively, everybody is welcome to, be, to belong to in the team. We had previous efforts in Japanese and, and Spanish, and the story of the team is that previous isolated efforts were made in Spanish and Japanese, and they were inspired by the carpentries, a way of localizing uh, teams and the infrastructure for, for localizing and translating. And this version, these translated versions were created uh, from a specific commit, so they were being up, up, updated. The pace of update of the Turing Way now um, requires that we keep the translated um, versions updated, so they don't they cannot branch from a specific commit, or they will become obsolete very quickly. And we had a demand for adding more languages and to keep up with the original content. We had an infrastructure that had not uh, support for uh, languages that are written in right to left, like Arabic, and um, we wanted to explore some options. Uh, automatic options that would help uh, the first step of the translation, so machine translation and translation memory. So um, in November 2021, a year ago in the book dash, we had a, a, a group that met and we have been meeting for this whole year, um, almost weekly basis. And we updated the, the translation and the proofreading work, workflow. We changed platforms. So now we have a, a, a uh, an infrastructure that is built in crowding. We have a draft of the translation guide, where I think there are updates about the translation um, of the, about the translation in the community guide. And we are our goal is that every language that exists has their own uh, translation guidelines because there are some decisions that are regarding technical vocabulary, but also about how inclusive language works in, in gendered languages, for example. So you, when you translate, we want to document the, the decisions that every team takes. Uh, and this should help for other teams that, that do this kind of work in other communities and in other projects. And this is inspired in the teaching tech together translation to Spanish. We are also having discussions about governance and awarding how we take decisions and how we organize ourselves and this is ongoing and we have been participating in conferences and meetings and and chats uh, and I don't have I wasn't working directly in the in this uh book dash but Batul and Pamela were and I don't know if Alejandro or Melissa do you want to say something about this work Alejandro or Melissa or should I continue Maybe we were on that on the illustration, but I know about the illustration, Andrea, and know exactly all the stuff. Yeah. Okay, so I I I know that in the previous share out, uh, Batul gave some updates about the work of this year. So I I I understand that uh, the material that was that was created in this year and in the previous book dash was updated, and. Uh, I will check the, the the recording for the previous the previous share out. But um, what I see is that uh, we have new guidelines of onboarding and offboarding, and that has part of, of the discussion of the governance. And uh, we have uh, a definition for paths and roles. So who's a reviewer, who's a proofreader, a translator, and who creates documentation? Who is in charge of the infrastructure? Because we want to have. Um, 
we have we want to have different branches for different languages, but how to build this into the Turing way and how it builds, how it how it gets deployed in in Netlify has been a, a an item that we haven't been able to solve. And um, that's it. I don't know if anybody wants to to say anything uh, in addition to this. But we have milestones for the translation, thanks to Melissa. So, what part of the part of our decisions is what is has priority during the during the um, the translation process? We want to keep up with this uh, writing and documenting the guidelines for each languages, and to find a way uh, that that uh, the Turing way and and Malvika and the rest of the core team has has been uh, finding trying to find a way to uh, to acknowledge the translators and the team leads. Uh, we are still solving the multi-language site deploy, and we would like, and it, this is a preliminary to create a translation dash. So some some event that is dedicated to to promote and advance the the translations. And so yes, we have some some coming news, and we have a we have a weekly meeting on Tuesdays, and we have a dedicated Slack channel. So your everyone is free is free to 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 join us in in whatever language you want to work and even if you don't even if you don't speak another language and you cannot help with the direct translation efforts there's some infrastructure related some there's another organization so there are lots of of tasks that that you're welcome very welcome to to join us if you want thank you Thanks so much, Andrea. Um, it looks like we have a question from Kirsty. And I, will I just say before passing the mic, um, I'm always just astounded by the work that you all are doing. Seriously, so incredible. Um, and have such deep admiration for the thought and collaborations that you all have. Um, we could stop for a question, but Kirsty, would you want to ask a quick question before we? Everyone from each group might have, um, there might be questions for each one. Um, um, so are, we low, are we low on time, Anne? Should I save my question? I could put it in the chat. I'll put, should I put it in the chat and folks can answer there? Would that be better? Yeah, I think that would yep. be great. Yep. Let's do that. No problem. No problem. Could... Hand down. Hand down. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Kirsty. Okay, so we're going to pass the mic now to, I believe, let me double check here. Uh, I'm going to pass it on to Danny to talk a little bit more about the infrastructure working group that just met for the first time T minus two weeks ago. All right, on to you, Danny. Amazing. Thank you, Anne. Cool. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the, the infrastructure working group um, has been pulled together by and there's um, a handful of people who are doing, uh, I think of it as kind of like behind the scenes stuff. So we make sure that all the packages are up to date and that when things, um, when the website is actually built, it does so in a, in the way that we expect it to do so and that any errors and warnings are dealt with um, so that the process of actually contributing content to the book is as smooth as it can be. Um, and as part of that, um, one of the other people in this group, Sarah, a couple of months ago, showed me how to build the book locally, which I was very embarrassed that I hadn't done at the time. And I've since realized that actually um, it's less scary than I realized, but also almost nobody that contributes to the Turing Way has done this thing. I was not um, in the minority. But in building it locally, it meant that I, for the first time, paid attention to all of the hundreds of lines of output that um that happened when uh when i built the book and i saw that a whole bunch of them mm -hmm. hmm. that link's giving me a weird link turn away issues mm -hmm. there we go i saw that a whole bunch of them all of these were warnings and they weren't kind of like hard errors, but they were things like broken links. And so they had real implications. They meant that images didn't show up. They meant that um, when people said, 
check out this thing. It didn't show up or it was unclear where they were referring to. And so I, um, I put it on my to-do list to just slowly work through all of these errors um, and, uh, and clean them up because that's the type of work that appeals to me. Um, while I was doing that, uh, Brigitte said, once these are fixed, we should change the continuous integration so that uh, um, essentially these types of errors are picked up when people commit this, um, this work. And so that gave me a bit of a kind of motivation to, uh, to clean up all of these errors and then clean up all of the errors that had been introduced while I was cleaning up those errors. Um, <laughs> Uh, and so I finally, a couple of days ago, caught up with the moving train and we hit go on, on uh, what I thought was going to be a really complicated commit, but it turned out that all we needed to do to the CI was add this tiny little flag. This W means that um, essentially it says treat warnings as a big issue. Um, fail the build when the warning happens, but also keep going so that we build the whole rest of the book so that you can see all the warnings at once. So we did that. Um, and that's great because it means now, so there's a pull request. I, now this, I want to be very clear, this is not naming and shaming um, because somebody has just put in a pull request for a new chapter. And I think this is a work in progress piece. Um, but I was very happy to see, oh, they've, committed something else while this talk has been going on. Dag dab. Anyhow, the, the previous checks were failing and I wanted to show you, um, I wonder if I can show you a previous check. You'll have to um, use, your, uh, use your skill of visualization. If one of these checks had failed, there'd be a big angry red cross next to it. And I could click on the, um, click on the details and it would tell me that it was failing because this chapter hasn't been added to the table of contents yet so nobody would actually be able to see it even if it was added to the book and that's great because it means that um, the issues get solved at this stage rather than a month down the line when somebody's like oh why can't I see that chapter um, which is great and that makes me really happy aha there we go this one's failed now I we've been joking around and saying like I've never been so happy to see a build fail um, because it means that we can fix it now. So it's exited with error code one. And if I scroll up to where I can see some red text, there we go. Yeah, document isn't included in top tree. So now uh, the author or I or somebody else can go back and go back and fix that before it gets committed to the book, which is great. Okay, so the other thing that I've been working on um, just this last week or couple of weeks bah, 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 is adding SVGs to the book. So SVGs are scalable vector graphics. So they are graphics that instead of being pixel after pixel after pixel are a set of instructions for lines, essentially. And that means that the lines are super crisp, no matter how much you zoom in or distort the image. And it also means that for images that are kind of lots of block colors and relatively simple shapes, like most of the Scriberia images in the Turing way, it means that actually the file sizes are considerably lower. And I've got a little demo here. So this is the Turing way logo. This is the Turing way logo SVG. So I can zoom into this hundreds of times and it still stays beautiful and crispy and sharp. But this is actually dramatically smaller than this one that gets real pixely if I go in. And of course, it's the logo. I don't expect people to be zooming in tons and tons, but this one off the top of my head, I think is about a hundred kilobytes, whereas this one is half a megabyte and it gets loaded on every single screen. Presumably it'll get cached, um, so that's less of an issue, but it does mean that just every time anybody goes to the book, it will load a little bit faster, which is an accessibility win 
in, in my eyes because it means that people from around the world on any connection um, are more able to interact with the book. So yeah, those are the two things that I've been working this week. Amazing. Thanks, thanks Danny. Um, I'm also going to drop in here a link to an issue, um, as well as a link to one more issue um, of uh, kind of a, a wider effort to, to gather other folks doing incredible work of like keeping the whole ship running of the Turingway repo um, and trying to see what other ways we can kind of strategize to keep it running even faster, better, and in more um, accessible ways, especially when it comes to low bandwidth environments um, um, and all sorts of different ways. So with that, I am going to pass the mic again to Hari, who will be telling us a little bit more about the reviewers and editors group. Cool. Hi, everyone. My name is Hari. Like when you go somewhere, could be in a hurry. Apologies, you've heard it before, especially if you're on the call this morning. It's been like six hours since you heard that gag. Um, I am a research application manager at the Turing Institute and also a core member of the Turing Way team um, and on the reviewers and editors working group as well. It's nice to see you guys. Um, unfortunately, this week we didn't have sort of like a set that we didn't have a um, the group attending Book Dash to achieve um, set deliverables and reviewers and editors working groups. I don't have like a specific thing I can show you guys of what we achieved this week, but I can update you in general on what we've been doing as a group and what we're trying to do as well. So I'll just share my screen. That one. Cool. Um, so just a couple of links for you guys. If you're interested in being part of the reviewers and editors group, please do join us on the reviewers and editors working group Slack channel on the Turing Way workspace more than welcome to join us. We're always looking for more people to help us through the work we're doing. And in essence, we basically have one sort of central store of updates and thoughts on what we're doing, which is a discussion thread on the Turing Way repo. So you can see it here. And if you just go into discussions, you can see it's the second one down. Let's go straight into it. Um, where we're basically updating it as and when we do some work and agree as a group, what we've got done, what we're trying to do, but also what a wider strategy is. So we started at a point, um, of thinking about facilitating content creation and editing. So thinking about um, how people can contribute content to the Turing way, um, not just books necessarily, but also videos, learning modules, blog posts, articles, all that kind of thing. Also thinking about what kind of direction we want to take content creation in. So we want to keep it very free form. What do we want to think about? For instance, if people want to contribute and know what to, can we give them like suggestions and ideas for the kind of thing we cover in the book? Um, and also thinking about how to facilitate that kind of creation. So if you look, if you have ideas, how can you easily get started them with an issue or a PR and writing some content? And if you want to contribute to ideas people have already had, how can you find the right issues and all that kind of thing? Um, so yeah, everything around facilitating, creating content and editing content as well. And <laughs> what you'll see is we've potentially gone down a bit of a rabbit hole in the, in the first few weeks of this working group existing. Um, but we started from a point of thinking, okay, in order to make, to facilitate content creation as it is at the moment, and especially editing content that exists, anyone who comes to the repo should be able to find in the issues, open issues and PRs, exactly what they want to be working on, how to work on them. So we're thinking, okay, how can we clean up the repo? Um, I think it's also where we're taking a bit of a maintainer's role as well. How can we clean up the repo to make it as easy to navigate and use as possible? And so we started from a very simple point of, okay, there's, I can't remember how many open the issues there were, but well, there are artists at the top. Um, 385 open issues. Let's split those in four. If we had, so the work we made up of myself, Esther, who's on the call, um, and Jen and Vicky, who aren't here, split them up into four, go through them and assess like whether we can close them, whether they're inactive, all that kind of thing, or whether they're still being discussed in live. Turned out to be a, a bigger job than maybe we were, we were first realizing and first intending it to be. And so we took an approach of, okay, let's, let's try a method of managing this um, quite big issue base um, with a process on a set small number of um, issues and see if we can find up uh, sort of create an efficient mechanism for doing so for a wider group. So we set up a Google Drive and an issue and pull, pull request review tracker, which you guys can also access if you follow the discussion thread. Um, and if you want to dive deep into some Excel functions, please do um, load it and go into it. 
But we started by saying, okay, if we take issues that were started in 2019 and were last active in 2019, that's thinking about anything like comments or um, any PRs that were made or anything like that, um, reviewing those and seeing whether we can close them or whether there's still discussion going on or other issues we can link them to or anything like that to clean it up. And so we created this spreadsheet, which is, you'll get an essence of this rabbit hole we've gone down. Um, but you've got the issues located on the left. So just all the issues that were created in 2019 and last active in 2019. This middle section is done, built on sort of consensus reviewing. So you've got all of our initials there. Um, and we took an approach of, so green for us is good and good means we can close the issue and clean up the repo. So potentially slightly counterintuitive because you might think green means keep open, but green for us means close it to clean up the repo. So people would go through the issues and say, okay, um, green, if we think this can be closed because nothing's really happening with it. Amber, if we're not sure, we should probably discuss it as a group and red for like that. We definitely shouldn't close this because there's ongoing work um, to be done with it. So we went through with that. And the idea was if we get three people saying green and we can definitely close it, we'd put an estrogen in saying, hey, we're just closing this issue. If you want to reopen it, you can and close it. If it was amber or red, we'd put in a, hey, we're just reviewing this and to let you know, we might have some updates on it in the coming weeks. We then realized there were a bunch of issues that were sort of, I don't know, we, we could close them straight away. That might just be like a question someone had that someone either commented saying the answer's here and then it was left open um, or sort of like a discussion that was never really started. And so we introduced the C category for anything that we could immediately close and whoever put that in, if I think three of us say it, we can close it straight away. Then we in, realized that some of the content was actually already in a book and it'd be good to highlight that. So when we're closing the issue to say, oh, the reason we're closing this issue is because this content is already live in the book here. Um, and if you want to make some edits, um, instead of creating a new chapter, you can edit what's already in the book. And so we introduced a fifth category of B for if it's already in the book, we can put that and then have a comment that automatically generates saying, hey, it's already in the book. What you uh, are maybe thinking, this is this feels quite convoluted. We are also thinking that as well. And the tricky thing is, so this is just issues from 2019. There were last actions in 2019. There's a bunch of them. I think we closed some columns. There are some rows, but there's like 80 of them. We still haven't worked our way through all of these. And that's just from like an initial evaluation of whether these should be closed or not. You can see all these um, actions that we think we should take here. Some of them are just comment with this specific text, but a lot of these are thoughts that people have put in saying, oh, I think like maybe, yeah, this is a chapter that could be written by the Rams or um, we should think about including this elsewhere as well. And we haven't yet had time or resource to discuss this stuff. So I think what we're figuring out is that we probably need a more efficient um, system for doing this kind of reviewing job, because if it's effectively, if it's so consensus driven, it will take a very, very long time for us to start cleaning up the repo. Um, so if you have ideas on ways to improve this, please do come talk to us. I think one thing we're thinking is if something feels like it can really clearly be closed, we should just close it and, and not worry too much about, we can sort of trust each other and allow one person to close it without necessarily having to um, go through like this consensus thing of getting three or four people reviewing it. And also potentially, because when you close an issue or a pull request, it's not gone forever, it just moves to closed. And we are sort of notifying the original authors of those issues. Hey, we're closing it. And if you want to reopen it, you can. Potentially taking a bit more of an approach of if it really doesn't look like it's gonna be actioned in the next X amount of time, maybe six months, um, we can just close it for now and give people the option to reopen it if they want to action it. So it's been a, yeah, a bit rabbit holy. I think there's sort of longer term things we want to do is thinking about like the strategy and run an improvement cycle around how to facilitate um, contributions and content creation for the book. Um, but at the moment where we are reviewing issues and pull requests, well, hopefully with the output of this is when you come load the book at some point in the new year, you'll say, oh, cool. There's a, like, a handful, I don't know what that number will be yet, X amount of open issues and look, oh, that's all this really lively conversation happening and I can find exactly what I want to and open pull requests that are clearly being action and progress is being made on them and should hopefully excite new users um, and not overwhelm new users for contributing. And then some guidance as well around, oh, hey, you want to write some stuff. Here's some thoughts on what you could write about. Here's some ideas on like structure and templating content. Um, I'm sure we could do a lot of work with the translation and localization team as well to say, oh, cool, you're going to write it in this language. We can also make it available in these languages as well, all that kind of thing. So yeah, please do join us for the journey. If you do want to um, especially go through this, this long list of issues and PRs, we would happily 
um, accept any support and help you can offer us. And yeah, also just to warn you guys, unfortunately, oh, I've got a question from Kirsty. Are there ideas for preventing this work going forward? Do you mean like preventing the complexity of the work we're doing at the moment? I guess I mean pre preventing having so many issues that need to be gone back to to kind of oh, assess sure. whether they should be open or closed. And yeah, I will sure, also but... say, whilst I'm unmuted, this is a hundred percent my fault because at the very <laughs> beginning I was like, just open an issue, just open an issue, open an issue. And so, thank you to the team for fixing uh, what what has snowballed. <laughs> no worries, Kirsty. And if you like, we're happy to leave you a bunch of issues to uh, review if you <laughs> want to take part in the process of the year. Um, good question. So on the, um, is that we have a process of this? I think we will. I think we want to make sure we strike the balance of like, we don't want to be like didactic and be like, if you open an issue, it can only be for these reasons and don't issue, open an issue otherwise. But I think we can, if we reduce the number down, we can still keep it pretty free form. But if people are opening certain types of issues and we're not sure whether if they're going to end up, we think they might end up in the, being this kind of situation, maybe a bit more of an active discussion around, oh, hey, like, do you think of actioning it this way? Or have you like gone to this issue and talks about that um, and being a bit more maybe responsive and having a process for sort of like addressing new issues as they come in and see if there's more efficient ways of actioning them. But I think it would, yeah, it would be a shame if we got to cleaned all of it up <laughs> and then didn't have a process in place to keep it clean and then did this again in 12 months time. I'm not sure if anyone would want to do that. Definitely, we'll try to support you with as much documentation as we can. Yes. Also, unfortunately, I'm sorry, I'm running late for a train, so I'm going to have to pop off <laughs> at some point soon. Um, if you have any questions, again, Slack channel or just send me a message, um, please, or anyone on the team a message. Thanks so much, Harry. I hope you go in a hurry to make your train. Hey, hey first time I got to use that in an actual phrase. <laughs> I'm never, uh, never hurrying because I'm so on top of my schedule. You know. <laughs> of course, of course. Um, we'll say what's been really interesting that we've seen over the course of the past even week, I will say that um, we just saw in an infrastructure uh, channel on the Slack, uh, folks talking about what it meant to review um, infrastructure related issues within the book. And it seems like all of these different working groups and tasks are all starting to like um, overlap in different ways. And it will be a really interesting and important challenge, I think, to be able to like make sure that communication is available across all of them while we start to formalize this work across the book. But Final thought before I go again, um, so this morning said again, thank you so much to Anne and the team for setting up these working groups. I think crystallizing like the different amount of tasks and jobs need to be done in order to like maintain the community and take it forward in a very progressive and like good, I don't know the word productive, like productive way of um, actually achieving things and moving forward is awesome and um, really appreciate all the work you put into it. So thank you. Good Thanks work. very much. Good luck making your train. All right, so we have our last um, rep of the working groups. I'm going to pass the mic to Emma, who would tell us a little bit about uh, the many things that the mentors and trainers group has been working on over the course of the past couple months. Thank you, Anne. Um, so I'm Emma Faroon. Um, I'm a senior community manager at the Alan Turing Institute and part of obviously the core Turing Way team, but the working group for the trainers and mentors. Um, we do think our name might be um, not great for us at the moment because we've actually been working more on sorting out talks, recording talks and workshops that have been done. And you will be very surprised in a minute with the number that have been done. So it's a I'll leave it as a mystery, but it's going to come in a minute. So, um, so our working group is made up of myself, Alden and Irini. Um, and um, we've essentially been going into, um, started off by going into the GitHub repository and looking at a folder, which was marked, I think, presentations or workshops was its name. And it had, um, from the very start of the Turing Way project, it had the first um, presentations there. So all of PDFs and a list. So we started off by just um, having a look at that and seeing if we could archive it sustainably because what we want to do is get those presentations out of the repository because they're very heavy on uh, their very large files and we want everything to be archived um, all of our talks all of our 
training workshops, everything to be archived on Zenodo. So that's essentially our end goal at the moment. So to do that, um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, we started off um, by setting up a project board on the GitHub repository, which you can see here. Um, so you can go and have a look at this because this is how we're sort of organizing ourselves. We do also have a Slack channel that you can join, which is called Trainers and Mentors WG for Working Group. So um, you can join that and see what we're chatting about. Um, and so um, we started off by um, having a look at this folder, which there was only 15 presentations in. It seemed very doable and we got through that quite quickly. Um, thank you to Kirsty, who most of them were hers, who was very good at archiving all of hers, and Sarah and Patricia also were very good at archiving them. So we just um, really um, updated the list in a, in a slightly different format um, uh, outside of the repository. But then we thought, oh, well, we need to find out uh, about other talks and if they've been archived. So Anne uh, said, oh, let's go and, look, go and look at the newsletters. And Alden made this humongous list of um which i'm going to show you now uh if i can find it which is here so this is our initial list you can see there's only 15. this is the new list which if i keep scrolling down has got all of the talks that have been done for the turing way up to date so it goes down to i think 121 talks so it's it's lots and lots of talks so what we're trying to do is we're going through, so this is um, the text that comes from the newsletter and what we're doing is we are formatting it, so bringing out the main bits of information and also making sure, so it's, if I go over this way, we're making sure that um, everything has a um, sustainable link, has a persistent identifier, so it's stored somewhere, most of them are on Zenodo, but um, any place is absolutely fine for us. So we're just making sure that they're all there um, and making this kind of master list so that you can actually go back and you could find a talk because um, we want all of our resources, to, uh, all of our talks to be reusable by everybody else. Um, so that's the one thing we're doing. If I get rid of that. Um, so then the other thing, uh, and I have to say, Alden did a lot of it. She's um, made a chapter, a new chapter in the Turing Way about giving a talk. And this week we met with Scriberia and um, we made an image to go with the chapter. So I think the chapter has been merged already. It's in the community handbook, hopefully. Is it, Anne? Yes, community handbook. It's if you want to present a talk or a workshop, you should go there. And um, essentially what Alden developed, and I think with Anne as well, um, is a template. So now when you want to go and give a talk, you start an issue on in the repository and uh, there is a specific template for actually giving talks um, and you can follow through the whole process which means that we won't have people putting um, uh, any pdfs of talks into our uh, github repository it's all going to be archived like we want it to be archived on Zenodo and we will be able to add it to this list as well so that we have a full list of all of the talks and workshops um, what we've also been doing, um, this is not a very interesting thing to see, is it? So I'm going to stop sharing. Um, what we've also been doing is we have been um, updating the templates um, so that there are um, a set of templates if you want to give a talk for us and represent the Turing way. Um, what we So there, there are some that have been created. Uh, I won't take no credit for that because I haven't even touched that. It's Alden again and Anne, I think, that have been updating that. So thank you very much. Um, but what we are going to go on to is we do a lot of training workshops. So this is where the train a bit um, comes in. So we are moving towards that word. Um, we do want there to be like GitHub training um, templates as well in there. So we have all of our training materials that we do are consistent um, and can be reused um, by anybody else. So they are available on Zenodo, but we just want the template. So it's a bit more usable, like the PowerPoint actually to be in our our own Google Drive folder, so we all know where it is, and we can we can have a link to it. Um, I think I've said everything. Let me just check what Alden said earlier because she was much better at talking. Um, yeah, I think I've said everything. So yeah, thank you very much. Oh, Anne, you need amazing, amazing. Um, as I said it this morning, and I'll say it again here, is that 
again, it really speaks to how much all the different groups can work with each other. Because when we were talking through, you know, what it meant to review the promotion pack this morning, we were thinking, oh, you know, what would working with the translation and localization team look like in order to have, you know, set slide decks about um, the work that they're doing that they would like to share out with other folks? Is there any way that we can combine, you know, presentations about translation and localization, translation uh, presentations about, you know, uh, maintenance within the project and its infrastructure. We used to give a lot of talks, for example, about Jupyter Book and Binder um, that we haven't given in, in a while. Um, how can we kind of create as many central places where all of as much information is as open as possible um, and as close as necessary, of course, to make sure that um, folks from all across the project can use it. So thanks so much for sharing. Um, I think before we move on for a second to general updates, I wanted to ask if there are any questions. I know we've just been kind of moving through it, but if anything comes to mind. Doesn't look like there are. I'll leave it for one more second. Uh, I, I just have a question, Emma, about the, the how you're tracking and you are now uh, creating tools. Like for instance, if I mention uh, the Turing way in a presentation that is not about the Turing way, but I have one slide, is something that I should do, like report in this kind of format? That's a good question. I think we really just thought about like when we are asked as, as the Turing way project to give a talk. That's you, so we tend to use those standard templates, but I think it would be really nice to have those recorded as well. I know Anne would like those recorded for the newsletter anyway. So even if you could open an issue, that would be great. I think, okay. wouldn't it, Anne? Yeah. We want you in the newsletter, surely. <laughs> yeah, it's really, that's a great question because especially, you know, we've seen how much uh, Scriberia images are downloaded and used in ways that we can't keep track of here, right? Um, people drop uh, tweets that they, or toots that they, you know, had used a Scriberia image. But we don't find out until that tweet or that toot is there. Um, so if there's a better way that we can keep track of that, that would be great. Uh, because it does say on Zenodo that we've had over 14,000 downloads. But what does that mean? Who is using them? In what context are Scriberia images being used? It's pretty amazing. Um, and it's definitely something we want to do more. Okay, so I'm going to zoom through a kind of retrospective of the past six, seven months. Um, thank you so, so much uh, to Emma, to Danny, to Andrea, um, to Hari for sharing more about what you're working on within the project, within teams and with each other. Um, this work, again, I'll say it a million times, is really important because we aim to formalize as much as possible the work that you all are doing um, and really to divest as much as we can our resources outwards to you all and to support you in all the ways that we can. So um, really thank you so, so much. Um, and honestly, you all rock. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen again and talk through a couple of awesome things that have happened over the course of the past eight months. Um, just to take a moment to go, man, 2022 has been a crazy year. Okay, so I will share my screen. Can you all see my screen okay? So I have a, sl a slide here that's kind of a play off of the slides of um, the kind of pr promotional material that we use for the fireside chats. It's like a um, kind of a slide with fire in the background, given that it is a fireside chat um, with all the bubbles or circular images that we use um, to show everyone's images who are co-organizers or participating in the fireside chat. Um, we've put them all together in one slide and I'd say we have over 49 people over the course of the 2021 to 2022 season of fireside chats that have co-organized and participated, which is really a huge number of folks from almost as many organizations. I think it was around 40. We co-organized um, fireside chats with over uh, nine uh, groups, leaders, um, folks really all across the open science ecosystem and much more broadly into the open ecosystem at large. Uh, there were some really important, um, important, fascinating topical conversations on everything related to the history of the Turing Way, as um, Kirsty could attest to, the very first fireside chat that was had right around this time last year. 
uh, to conversations about open infrastructure, open infrastructure roles, um, defining open infrastructure in the first place, uh, open hardware, um, the history of the Turing Way as a project. If I'm remembering, there's so much translation and localization about, about navigating questions of navigating scale. And I think there are probably oh, citizen and with citizen science and citizen and participatory science kind of closing us off for the year. Uh, so it's been really an incredible series. Uh, looking forward to the 2023 season. Um, and if you have any topics, things that you'd like to, to bring to the space, uh, please, please reach out. We want to experiment with more formats in the upcoming year and um, maybe give uh, the space as an opportunity to do things like series, to be able to have more folks hosting fireside chats of their own for topics that are important to them in different ways. Also just um, shout out here to everyone that one, we were featured in the Gold Acre Review, which was a um, national review on the use of health data for research and analyses. The Turing Way was featured um, and that project was really speaks to, again, the long tail of the Turing Way that you know we only find out when it reaches publication, which is really incredible and speaks to um, how awesome the resource is, but also how much the community has really aimed to kind of push it out into the world. We're also nominated um, or com as a commended project in the Hidden Ref project. We were nominated as well for the Open UK Awards, uh, the ceremony of which I believe is happening at the end of this month. Um, and we were also recently featured in a report by Energy Catapult um, as an example of what this kind of transition from data science in academic settings to industry settings looks like in real time. Again, long tail of the Turing Way. It's uh, truly amazing to see it kind of spreading in so many different directions. A little bit more about talks and workshops here. Um, I have to double check this with the spreadsheet that you all have made, but counting through the um, through the mailing list and the newsletter, we'd had over 34 talks, workshops, keynotes, and presentations given since the last book dash, which was in May, 2022. Um, and around 50 in 2021 alone, which again, just speaks to the huge volume and number of folks that are talking about the Turing Way in all different places. Um, we also trialed a couple of new workshops in hackathon style formats. Um, there was a, a GitHub workshop that kind of took people from zero to 200 over the course of two hours that we trialed at CarpentryCon this year. Um, thank you to Hari, to Sophia and Esther for developing um, this workshop. And I will actually stop here to say that a person who participated in this GitHub workshop who had never used the tool before, um, who had just started learning how to like work online in asynchronous ways, just participated in her first book dash um, all over the course of this week and added a new chapter to the Turing Way. And again, that speaks to you know going over the course of three months to learning how to use GitHub to being able to contribute um, some of our expertise in data curation. And maybe if someone wants to drop that new chapter into the chat, um, that would be awesome. But again, uh, definitely something that we want to template and then try in other spaces as well. We also uh, trialed a research infrastructure rules hackathon, which was again, an experiment in seeing if we can take ideas that people are interested in and wanting to talk through topics that are important for folks in different areas to translate that into writing exercises and maybe into chapters in real time. Um, again, a kind of zero to 200 uh, style workshop. Thank you to Ariel Bennett and Jennifer Ding um, for trialing uh, this um, trialing this uh, hackathon most recently at the Big Team Science Conference. Um, and also a shout out to Danny, who's given two talks, um, workshops, kind of Zoom, recorded Zooms through the world of the Fediverse and Mastodon Fostodon, um, and has been our kind of go-to person uh, ever since we've seen the most recent meltdown of Twitter being the thing that's really pointing us in new directions. So. We're really, really grateful for that because I think it's really it speaks to, again, folks within the community really pointing us in new directions and better ways of thinking through the technologies that we use. Um, also want to have a big shout out here to Lena who co-hosted and designed an experimental data conversations event over the course of this week. Um, 
which brought together folks from two projects that are closely aligned to the Turing Wave, um, where they were able to talk about uh, innovation and health data context. And also another big shout out to Andrea and to Liz, who are here um, for leading the first uh, conversation and workshop around accessibility, giving two really important, really topical um, presentations uh, related to accessibility in the case of screen readers um, and the use of alt text um, for data visualizations as well as accessibility in the case of folks with hard of hearing in deaf environments. So thank you both to you both. Um, it's definitely something that we want to continue moving forward. Like we said in the workshop, it's really just the beginning of the conversation. And finally, uh, we did have, as uh, Emma talked through earlier, a new kind of examples or case studies or ways of presenting the Turing Wave that kind of we experimented with this year from developing a new slide deck related to case studies uh, to a localization presentations that um, Andrea was talking through before that's really speaks to again um, folks talking about different parts of the project in many different spaces. Just adding this all here. Um, this was some recent chapter updates from before the book dash. Um, there were new chapters added related to everything from research infrastructure developers um, to model uh, machine learning model licenses, uh, personal stories, case studies um, for folks who are um, research software engineers, new chapters related to sensitive data, data papers, peer review, um, as well as uh, considerations to keep in mind when developing open source governance. Again, these are edits from before Bookdash, and there are definitely many more to add here. Uh, also, just a big shout out to all the folks um, really across the working groups, uh, across really the whole project who uh, maintain it um, in many different ways and ensure its sustainability uh, going forward. And really just a shout out to all of you here. And I think with that, that was a zoom through the big wide world of what the Turing Way has looked like for the past six to eight months. So I will stop sharing my screen. And then pass the mic back to Emma, who will guide us through the fun stuff of folks walking us through what they've been up to this week. Thanks, Anne. So it is the exciting bit. It's what have we done this week bit. So um, if you haven't signed up yet and you still want to share something out, then please, you could say in the chat or just put it in the document um, and I'll shout you out. So I'm actually just handing over to the first person who is Aditi, which I, oh, you are out there. I can see. Hi, you've done an, Hi. I've noticed you've done an amazing amount this week. So well done. <laughs> yeah, hopefully so. So should I share my screen? Yes, please. Do you see it? Yes. So uh, this is one of the things which I did. Um, the previously, the sensitive data, the overview was fairly short, but uh, I kind of added the different levels of um, uh, like sensitive data and uh, how this data classifications could be done based on context, uh, context and user-based. And of course, like what are the common reasons which fall under the high sensitivity thing? So uh, yeah, just added a bit more details to the previous, um, previous commit, I suppose. And then added a bit more to the personal data, um, adding that what consists of the direct identifiers and even putting some links to it and uh, direct and indirect both. And then just putting more examples because sometimes I think that people don't understand what, uh, what cons uh, consists of the direct and indirect and uh, the levels of sensitivity and such. And because I kind of work with this kind of data more. So I think this kind of information is very useful for me. So I just added it there. Um, and then I just added um, in here, this was uh, really about like certain links, which was already like, uh, I think recommended in one of the issues before. So on adding those, I kind of uh, figured that some of the things were needed to move around a bit, like put in front of the other and something. So I just added it here. And then, wait. This was 
Okay, so this is the latest, it's the chapter, which I'm uh, like, it's actually ready to be merged. Um, so yeah, this is, this is actually the example which Danny had taken uh, before, and it was crossing out on the, all the checks, but thankfully, thanks to Esther, she has been working with me to get it done. So this chapter is kind of, if I merge it, it will be looking something like this. It's on the uh, research ethics for social data. And I was really very keen to put this chapter outline in here because um, I had, that was kind of the intention of participating in the um, this during Dash event. So I'm really happy about that. So I will do that and possibly maybe add also the Scriberia image, which um, we had in the, uh, in the morning. So yeah. That would be like a good start. And I can maybe continue on this in the next book dash. Yeah. You, would you, well, one, be able to share this link to the preview in the chat? Two, are you interested in doing a live merge with us of your new chapter? Do it, wait. <laughs> I think we're, we're ready. Would you, are you, are you ready to go? I am always ready to go, but I was just wondering, should I put the image before I merge it or should I? Wait? No, the, Im the image won't be ready for a bit anyway. So oh, okay. yeah, it will have to be another one. So yeah, then go, for it. As well. go for it. No <laughs> pressure. <laughs> Live merge. Yay. Oh, that's so great. Yay. <laughs> it does take a few minutes to update the book but I should be able to see it in a few minutes. So, yeah. yeah, but it should look something like this. So I'm really happy to have added this chapter before the end of this week. I was really worried about like, maybe it would not be done within the span of days because everything was taking more time than I had anticipated. You've done so much. We are so grateful to you. And you didn't say this is your first book, Dash, isn't it? And you've yeah, here yeah, and yeah. you've done all this amazing work. So, wow. It's amazing. So I think you need a big round of applause, everybody. So thank you. It so wouldn't much. have been possible without the help of everyone else, like especially Annie and Esther. I had been like asking for them, like, would you be able to take a look? Would you be able to take a look? That I had been literally bothering them with this. <laughs> not bothering, it's collaboration. So that's yeah, how, not... how we roll here. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Thanks so much. Have you, I'm just checking. Have you said everything you wanted to say? Because I feel like we did disturb uh, yes, you yes, with the merging. Yes. Yeah, brilliant. So, <laughs> thank you very much. Let's give a DGL a massive round of applause because that's amazing. Oh, Esther got kicked out. Yay, well done. Oh. Amazing. Congrats. Right. Um, so next here, next here I can see Danny, but I think Danny, you shared your work already, didn't you? So yep, I got confused where to put it in the document. My bad. No problem at all. No problem at all. Okay, so we'll roll down then to a man. A man, you are next. Yeah. Hi everyone. I'll just share my screen. All right. Yeah, I hope my screen is visible. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hi everyone. So for a little context, I'm Aman and I am a participant in the sixth cohort of OLS and I'm working on the research software guide for undergraduates. And uh, this was my first book dash and it was quite exciting, although it's sort of tough following up Aditi uh, after all the work that she has done. But yeah, here we go. So uh, there was this issue that was already there about how to write documentation for a project. And that is what I concentrated on. So I think majority of my time just uh, went away with planning the chapter itself. Because uh, as the, as yeah, as uh, is evident with like all the resources that we have for documentation, uh, it can be a lot. Like, so the, the pr main problem that we had to tackle was to sort of structure the chapter in a way where we are not uh, overpowering the user, the audience, and we're sort of not uh, giving them a lot of information all at once and sort of are able to break it into chunks of information. 
So yeah, this was the issue that was, I think, yeah, 2020. And they had some suggestions already. So I sort of picked up on them. And then we had another issue, which also had some recommendations about documentation. So I initially discussed all of this with Malvika and we came up with a rough plan on how to go about this. And then we had some other resources in mind that we wanted to include. Uh, like we have this uh, documentation guide that sort of gives us a framework on how to structure everything. And we wanted to inculcate some of this too, but we did not want to repeat everything. So after like sort of getting the uh, structure together, right now it's it's quite a work in progress, but I'll sort of show the overview. So it's rough around the edges right now. So this is basically the chapter that is planned and uh, where we first basically start with the documentation chapter and we give some overview, like why you need documentation. Then Malvika had put an amazing list uh, of why document in a carpentry chapter, I think. And we reuse that for all the reasons, wonderful reasons why we should document our work. And same for facilitation of the documentation. This is again, all Malvika here. And then we sort of uh, go to how to document using that framework and we have to link that framework here. And then this is again, an overview of what we want here in this section. So the general outline is like, we have the overview and then we have three sub chapters. Now, uh, this is where like all the tidbits come in. So we, the first ch sub chapter that we have planned is technical documentation, which will again have sort of uh, API documentation, user's documentation and how you would like your technical documentation to be structured and like some of the suggestions that are there. Then we move on to language and platforms. That is something very important again, providing the users with choice to the kinds of languages that we use and the services that they can use for documentation. So again, right now, uh, we uh, sort of converged on what all services we need to add. And I have to add the actual information here, of course. And then a final chapter then again that Malvika recommended was workflows on how to sort of use these tools together and how to put it all together. So that's the draft uh, PR that I've put in right now. And that was basically to organize the sub chapters. But yeah, I have to add everything. and. Uh, this this was an amazing experience and special thanks to Anne, Malvika and Esther for helping me throughout and helping me with all my doubts. So yeah, I've linked everything in the issue itself. And I, I really had fun uh, working with the Scriberia artist uh, with Saranjit where uh, we, we sort of just, it was magical to see how we were just speaking and they were able to put our ideas on the screen itself live in front of us. That was amazing. So yeah, thanks a lot for having me. Thanks so much. And you've done amazing work this week too. That's loads. Uh, I like how you've taken on really old issues and like merged them together and kind of move forward, which is amazing. So thanks so much. Brilliant. Right, let's move swiftly on because I can see the time is going quite quickly. Uh, next is Alejandro. Hi, hi everyone. So this is with Dash again, I'm very excited. And I participate some days, not all week, but uh, I joined it uh, with Anne. Anne, you there? Yeah, Anne. <laughs> we worked together in a, in a chapter about research objects in action inside the communication. And in this chapter, uh, we've been trying to add some ideas uh, with some uh, concepts that we've been implementing in our own projects. And we decided it was good to share with the Turing Way community. So let, let me share the screen because we finally in, in the second boot dash and thanks to Esther, Malvika, uh, Muhammad, Muhammad, if I'm saying well his name, we published and now it's merged. And this is the chapter uh, where basically it contributes and is related to research data management. And we, in the previous boot dash, we have this illustration Basically, uh, we finally uh, made an adapted the suggestion from the reviewers. And basically, we also as well added how to contribute. And recently, and she participated in a conference about digital objects fair. And it's a concept that is quite similar. And it is still a very evolving concept. So we expect that people that are working in this fair digital objects and contribute in the future to the chapter and maybe if you need to change something, it's something that is, as I say, very uh, a topic that is evolving over time. And we added these typologies 
of different research objects that most most the one the, the one that we are familiar are this software centric and data centric but they are very interested about bibliography centric so you are welcome to read the content because it's very uh, is in somehow for me it was something new that i have been learning in the past years and we also add some platforms so tensor tensor uh, tens as well malvika and you can see all the process uh, here we as well have someone oscar corcho that is an academic in this topic and he made a, a contribution via pdf that was something different that we never have before but we implement his suggestions yeah maybe <laughs> you want to say something and and the motivation about this chapter mm, not much more than uh, what you said i mean the really the idea is uh, to think about open science and when you share while you are doing and not at the end so that was the original idea of this uh, research object um, so we may add some more information and link it to open science later on but that was the original idea yeah and also with Anne then we work together in, a, in another new illustration uh, we've been working in executable notebooks communities and we have I don't know if we need we share this now or later sorry for the span is that later the illustrations you can show it now we've seen it it's like a quick well, show it show it quick <laughs> okay okay it's quick i know that is very late from some of you there but essentially is this this is the illustration oh. that we have for the uh, notebooks that we'll be working with Anne, and it's a kind of community that aims to help people who are not sure what they're doing with their notebooks and they they know that is somewhere a help someone that can help out there so basically this community health and it's something that we are trying to maintain with the environmental data science boot community but there are others like the Turing data histories that they help improve the narrative uh, help and give you ideas about visualization and other tools and uh, the roles of the maintenance is more edition and at the end you have a, a book that is more interactive and end users can play with this notebook and as well uh, others can reuse it and customize so we made this kind of a sketch for the notebook that maybe we can document as a new chapter about notebooks in the Turing way about these communities that i guess they are gaining a lot of relevance so uh, this was an idea uh, that we have with Anne, and i don't know Anne again you want to say something about no i mean i i, I like the idea that was said it was a very nice experience with this Criberia right? because we we had no clue what we wanted to have at the end because uh, um, we were not very structured and we didn't explain it very well. Um, but uh, step by step, I think uh, she really managed to capture the idea we uh, we wanted to uh, highlight. I mean, like the concept. So I'm, I'm very happy. I don't know, Alejandro, if you are happy with it. Right. Yeah, I'm very happy and it's very useful for our executable notebook, no ours that we are, mem are, are members, but also others, as I said, very general. And maybe we can think about new content for the Turing way to document all this process. Yeah, so that was the kind of main uh, thing that I did. And also I collaborated in the translation, in the sketch in the translation, but let's keep that one for later. <laughs> I don't, and as well uh, for the set, I did some review of the open review and open pair review and code review uh, section update that she she already merged it so yeah that was the kind of update channel thank you so much yep. lots of work too and we had you in the jungle on the first day which was very amusing to us <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> now i'm more in the city now I'm more <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much a round of applause Brilliant. Thanks so much, Alejandro. Anna. Oh, I've just muted myself. Uh, okay, so let's uh, jump on to the next people who I can see is Liz and Andrea. Hi, everyone. Just checking that Liz is here. She's back. Yeah. Cheers. Liz, I don't know if everybody here in the room knows you yet, so, so maybe we could also introduce our work by introducing ourselves. 
if you if you want to talk of course or if you want to do it in the notepad maybe you go ahead and talk andrea okay we will we in any case Liz, whenever you want to interrupt me i am here ready um so there was a previous hi Liz. <laughs> I I will share the the links to the issues and to the notepad. I already put them in the in the collaborative notepad for today. And uh, there was there have been some previous issues and and possibly some discussions with other members of the Turing Way about the possibility of adding an accessibility guide that would be a sixth guide to the to the Turing way. And of course, this is no work for a week. So with Liz, we have been discussing possible structures and some considerations about language, about how to structure it, what content would it have. Uh, Liz, do you want to do you want to talk a little bit more about these discussions? I'm so sorry, I was on mute. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see, where should I start? Because um, I think you started introducing well that we are um, putting in place a structure for a guide on, on accessibility. Um, and Andrea has brought some really important concepts uh, to motivate how we do this. Um, I, uh, we have added the, Andrea has added the infrastructure for the chapter and we've been working on a pad to begin writing a landing page. We worked with Stephanie yesterday on a graphic. Um, and uh, in, in our pad, we're starting to write kind of a landing page and also a structure for how to um, talk about kind of the, the social role of the need for accessibility and also um, particularly a guide for how to implement the different accessibility practices that we use um, both to make sure that the book is accessible and to make sure that everyone can participate in working on the book. So it's it's pretty broad because it covers meetings like this and conferences and, and all the applications that we use uh, and how what kinds of workarounds we can implement when they're not perfectly accessible. Um, and we decided that although traditionally a lot of times guides to accessibility break things down by type of disability, uh, we decided to focus on the kinds of accessibility practices we use both uh, to avoid using kind of a deficit model to talk about disability and also because some of the accessibility practices um, benefit a wide variety of people. Um, and uh, we are going to continue to work to edit kind of a, a bit of text for the landing page and outline the structure of this chapter. Um, we also spent some time talking about how we're even going to define accessibility because um, it is sometimes used more narrowly in the case of, of things we do for uh, inclusion of people with disabilities, but in the context of the Turing Way and open science, there are a lot of other considerations like um, not requiring high bandwidth to participate so that people with different levels of internet access can, can uh, feel a part of, of creating and sharing their, their knowledge and experience. Um, so um, it's, it's kind of a big complicated um, 
set of concepts to talk about, but I, I love that definition that Andrea just shared in the chat and I will let her add anything to what I might have said. Thanks, Liz. Yes, I was sharing it while you were talking because because we wanted to emphasize the part the part that part of the accessibility practices are decisions that we take. It's behavioral. It's uh, related to how we how we how we expect people with all kinds of disabilities to be part of the community and how all all the community. Um, so not only the technical part, which is going to be part of the content of the guide, because some people know that some practices exist but don't know how to implement them so we have uh, some references and some experience implementing some of them and and we have worked in together and in other working groups in these working workarounds like when something is not accessible what do we do to ensure some participation so these are decisions that are not necessarily technical things so and uh, um I, I I can I can in in the notepad we have uh, like uh, like an overview about uh, about uh, a possible table of contents and uh, I, I I it's it's preliminary but I would like to emphasize that we are going to talk about the language about disability there are, there has to be a, a language about language about how we talk about and with and how open communication is crucial to 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 address disabilities in both senses in disability in disability related technicals and practices but also access uh, in general and we have a series of technical of technical uh, sections like alternative texts uh, the choice of colors creating accessible slides which are which is another topic that will probably link to the visualization and how to create for example accessible events that will link to the slides and to the visualization part so it's a lot of intermingling topics that we hope uh, can can help in practical terms but also like in uh, the reflection about the platforms that we use so Slack, chats, how Zoom works, how we speak here in the meetings, these kind of, of topics. If I can just jump in here to say that conversations with Andrea and Liz over the course of this week have really asked huge questions about the foundations of really every aspect of the project. So alongside, you know, um, the documentation of creating a new chapter. We're also going through the process of revisiting everything from community share outs, like events like this, um, to our event programming, to the documents that we use, all of these other elements really ask the big questions about, you know, when we say open, who, who are we open to? Uh, when we say open to everyone, who is everyone? Um, and really just thank uh, them so much for their time this week. Like, to be able to ask questions and, and engage in really all elements and all parts of um, all aspects of this social, technical, behavioral um, parts of accessibility. And so just adding to that massive, massive thank you. Thank you. So, so I thank you, Liz. Thank you, Andrea, for sharing that. I'm really excited to see that extra guide. I think that's really exciting. And yeah, let us know. I think if we can help you, I'd be I'd be really um, really like to help. So yeah, just, um, well, I'll have a look at your PR there. Thank you very very much. I can see Mackenzie's happy now because she was eating. So <laughs> um, okay, so next up um, there is oh, there's only two left. It's me and Anne. I'm going to go first because Anne's is more amazing than mine. So I will feel bad if I I let Anne go first. So. <laughs> so I have just been hopping around this week doing lots of different things hosting different sessions and sorry my kids are here if you hear them um and um helping out some things I'm busy Aqua where is the other no sorry <laughs> um 
So, yeah. And so what I started doing is um, I started to embed some videos into the census data um, chapters. So I did one on a page that Aditi actually um, had been editing the overview. Um, so I've, I've managed to get that done in the last uh, last few days. Um, and then I've also been um, sorting out some PRs, which were some really old ones. I quite like doing that kind of stuff, but like Danny sorting some old stuff out, you know, and getting it merged. So I've been doing that. Um, I also this week I've been chatting a lot to Aaron and Malvika about community management because we're trying to write this paper, sort of position paper about community management uh, in our from our Turing team. Um, and so we have uh, done two Scriberia images, um, which I'm sure we will see some in a minute. Um, and yeah, and then I spent uh, the rest of the time just doing some reviews um, for Aditi and Esther and Winnie. Yeah, and just helping out really. Um, and that's it. And a lovely week. So thanks for everyone. And over to Anne. Thanks so much, Emma. Um, uh, I think for this last part, just to close us off, um, I know we're just a little bit over time and we didn't have enough time to be able to do as many questions and answers as we as we could. So if you have any other questions of any of the folks that have presented some amazing things throughout uh, this afternoon, evening, or sometime during the day, where depending on where you are in the world, um, please ask, please write in the chat. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to show you all something that I showed this morning that I just got to work over the course of the past 24 hours. Um, and it's a little bit of a data visualization experiment experiment. So I'll give a little bit of, of background here. Um, I do come from a data visualization background, uh, but more on the data journalism side of things. And especially after the course of this week, you know, and really over the course of the past eight months, um, I was asking, you know, you know, can we dive into the history of the GitHub repository of the Turing way and do something funky or cool there? Um, can we learn more about it? Like what does the history of the Turing way look like as a visual? But then, um, of course, that visual is, you know, a network graph that shows a series of nodes of different parts of the Turing Way and chapters being developed in real time. But I asked the question as someone that loves sound art and sound artists, is there a way to hear the repository of the Turing Way um, alongside a visualization? So um, I collaborated with a couple of different friends and we've been exploring the history of the repo and developed a couple of different videos that allow you to see a data visualization, um, but also hear the repo in real time. So in order to show you all a preview of that, I'm going to take my headphones out, share my audio on my screen, and you might be able to hear the little, a little Turing Way symphony. Oh, all right. So just a little bit of a background here. It's using a series of open source libraries. Um, one's called Sonic Pi that we would customize, um, which I'll link in the chat. And then the other is um, Gorse, which is a, another kind of software visualization platform. And I think the goal, this is a little bit hacky, um, but the goal is maybe to make something like a template so that others can use it too for their own repos. Okay, let's see about sharing my screen. So there are a couple different speeds. This one is a, a two minute long video. Okay. Can you all hear me okay? Okay. These little donuts. So now we're currently in 20, 2019, 2018. Let's see if I can move this so I can see. We're in now April 2019. And each node represents a single person. So the same note you hear is the same person. And now in December 2019, January 2020.
June 2020. And there are kind of different parts of this web that are starting to expand in real time. I think a couple of failed forks that became branches in and of themselves and then came back. This is February 2021. Now seeing a tree of around five different branches. September 2021. You can see here a different set of usernames that are contributing. January 2022. See an expansion of three other guides. Now we're in June 2022. The last one there was October 27th. Hello and welcome oh, to Oh, and Get now and I'm accidentally showing you a a uh, an introduction to Get and GitHub. Um, I'll link the video in the in the chat in case you'd like to see that one that was around two minutes long. There's a four minute long one that's a lot slower, um, and there's a 20 second one that I didn't upload because it kind of sounds like static because it's so fast. But yeah, thanks for thanks for watching and listening. Thanks so much, Anne. That's amazing. I think you've blown everyone away with that. Right, I think, uh, is there anybody else that hasn't shared out that wanted to share out today? Or this afternoon, or this afternoon, this morning, this evening, whichever is your time zone. I don't want to miss anybody out. Why? Yeah. Yes, Esther's saying yes. Go after Anne now that she's shown us that. <laughs> Somebody needs to. Uh, okay, right. So, um, Anne, do we want to take a few? Have we got? We haven't really got time for any questions, have we? Do you want to just close this out? Are there any urgent questions that while we're all here together in the same space, you want to ask of each other? When is the next book stash, you might be asking? Where can I find more spaces like this? Where can I come and hang out with all of these great people? Well, <laughs> we have a last collaboration cafe of the year um, happening December 7th, I believe. Um, I can link, I'll link the information in the chat as well as put it into the Slack channel. Um, we also are in the works of planning a kind of holiday end of 2022 um, hybrid event of some sort. So stay tuned for that. Um, but more than anything, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for staying a little bit over time and for taking time out of your days to be with us during Book Dash, to hear what folks have been up to. Um, and so, so, great to see all the different things that everyone's working on. And we really thank you for your time and your thoughtfulness um, and for all of your sharing. I don't really think I have anything else to add there besides you rock. And it's lovely to have uh, Kirsty here who was, if I didn't mention at the beginning, a found the founder of the Turning Way Project all the way back in 2018 and 2019. I'll very briefly say that the thing in my life that I'm most proud of is Miss Mackenzie. <laughs> and the second thing that I'm most proud of is the Turing Way. And this is absolutely like better than I could ever possibly have dreamed. And I dreamed really, really big when we started the Turing Way. So this is amazing. Thank you so much, everyone. Truly, truly incredible, incredible work. Beautiful. So and do you want to take a picture before we go? Yeah. We okay. back in? So if we want to, all right, shall I cap Esther, down? bring your cap. Wait, wait for Esther and her cap. Oh, Esther, bring your cap back. We have Esther with a 
background and a white cat that is blending. Oh, I do have a video on. Is Melissa here? All right, we'll take a second. I'm going to count down from five. And if you all maybe want to do a little wave, a little heart. <laughs> all. all right, I'm going to count down from five. Five, four, three, two, one. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, hope to see you soon. And thanks again for thanks what so much to you, Anne, for all your hard work this week. I'm just here helping out. <laughs> It's real Thank privilege everyone. for you, y'all. Have a good rest of your days. Bye. Thank you. Really amazing. Thank you all. Well done. Thank you.